So here we are. Okay, so again. So welcome everyone to this uh, Population Dynamics virtual seminar. Uh, today we have as a speaker Alvaro Sanchez from uh, CNB CISC Madrid and uh, he's going to talk about global epistasis and the emergence of uh, function in microbial consortia. Uh, so Alvaro had a master in theoretical physics in Madrid, then a PhD and postdoc in uh, biophysics and uh, evolutionary system biology in uh, the US and uh, he got a PI position at Harvard. He, he became associate professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Yale and now is a PI in Madrid, as I already told you, in the Department of Microbial Biotechnology, something regarding uh, his uh, interest. So he's working at the inter interface between uh, system biology and microbial community ecology and evolution. Um, he has different goals and aims, uh, one of which is to link and predict microbial community composition and community function. Uh, he works with a combination of uh, theory and experiments, and so he also uh, builds up in, uh, microbial consortia from the top down by um, engineering. So with this one, I would like to leave the audience, uh, sorry, the, yes, the whole the audience at the stage. Uh, to our uh, speaker of today. I'll stop sharing my screen if I can, yes. So please, Alvaro, you can start sharing yours and the audience is all yours. All right. Um, well, hi everybody, thank you for, for giving me your attention today. As, as Marco was pointing out, I am, I am happy to be interrupted if everything is not clear. Hopefully the talk is not gonna be too long so that there will be also time for questions at the end. Uh, I may not see you uh, if you raise your hand because I, I often minimize the, <laughs> the the faces on the screen so I can see it fully. But uh, so just maybe just raise your voice and and uh, well not raise your voices, <laughs> speak right <laughs> if you want to uh, uh, if you want to interrupt me at any at any time during my presentation. Um, yeah, so our our lab is uh, fundamentally trying to understand that this today um, how. Um, to engineer micro communities. And um, one of the main objectives we have is to figure out ways in which we could map the composition and function of micro communities in a quantitative way. Um, and um, just to give some context, normally when we think of micro communities, uh, the, the first things that tend to come to mind are things like the human microbiome or perhaps uh, the soil microbiomes or, or the ocean microbiomes. Those, microbial communities that assemble in nature and which play such important roles, both in our health, in the case of the microbiome, as well as in the in global biogeochemical cycles and the health of animals and plants um, when uh, they are in their natural habitat. But I, the, the main thing we study is a series of microbial communities that have uh, still a lot of relevance, but that they're often uh, under uh, studied from the perspective of microbial communities, which are those that form in, in biotechnological settings. Uh, just to give you here one example, the production of uh, biofuels like bioethanol in sugarcane bio refineries in Brazil, um, that production is being carried out primarily by microorganisms like yeast. And these yeasts that uh, ferment uh, the sugars in the environment to produce the biofuel are cohabiting with a complex community of bacteria uh, whose composition has been recently discovered to have a, a fairly sizable importance in the yield uh, of, of fuel that is obtained in these reactors. And um, because of the strong economic significance of this process, it is often important not only that we're able to describe in a qualitative way uh, how, you know, which microorganisms are there, what kinds of functions are being produced, and, and gain an understanding of how that works. But it's often important that we are able to engineer and optimize these processes so that um, they, we can extract uh, uh, as much productivity from them as, as it is possible. And, um, and these, uh, the, the many uses that microorganisms have in biotechnological settings, which range from the production of biofuels to the production of biofertilizers, colorants, uh, all kinds of different drugs, vitamins, 
uh, antibiotics, uh, food production, and so on and so forth, make it very important and um, understandable that we learn how the functions that these microorganisms uh, provide uh, are, can be optimized uh, to the maximum. So the, the main question we are trying to figure out in our lab is how to do this, right? And um, we're framing in the same in the following way, right? So imagine that uh, what we want to do is um, work with people that have maybe a list of candidate species that they uh, would be thinking about introducing in a bioreactor, and and telling them of all the possible microorganisms that you could introduce in a in a bioreactor, which particular ones should be placed in there if we wish to uh, optimize the amount of say biofuel or you know, a colorant or any other function that we would be interested um, in our consortia to delivering, right? So again, you know, given a list of candidates, which ones should be selected to, to be placed in a, in a bioreactor to optimize a particular function of interest? And in our, in our lab, we call this the, the coaches dilemma because it's, it's a very similar question uh, than the one um, posed by sports coaches everywhere, right? So which players as, uh, sitting on the bench should be brought into the, into the, into the field if uh, you wish to uh, increase the score as much as possible and win, win the game, right? So it's a kind of a similar question, but with microorganisms. And um, the, the, what one would like to be able to do is to answer this question in the best possible way would be to um, be able to predict how um, adding each member of that list to the um, uh, to the to a bioreactor would affect the amount of um, say biofuel produced, right? So uh, if we are able, if we had a way to predict that for every candidate we had, as well as every poss possible combinations of them, then we would have the answer to the question, right? Because we would be able to, to tell, okay, well, these are the one or two or three microorganisms that are predicted to have the maximum possible effect. Yes. So um, the main, so this is basically the, the the main goal, right? And and the challenge that we face is that at the moment we still lack theoretical tools that can be used to offer a solution to this. Um, this microbiological coaches dilemma, right? And, and, and identify which particular set of microorganisms should be uh, incubated together to get optimal results. Um, so um, the, the question then is, is why is this difficult to do? Why, why don't we have already tools to, to do that, right? And I wanted to just uh, illustrate the, the challenge of this by giving you a very, very simple example. Uh, this comes from work that we, we published a few years ago and carried by Alicia sanchez Borostiava and Jorge Vallit. And, and, and in this work, what we were looking for was a consortia that would produce uh, amylase, right? So we had a, a bunch of different bacteria, like for instance, in this case, this uh, strain of Pisereus that secretes an enzyme called amylase that breaks down starch, right? Um, and um, when it start, uh, amylases can have a technological importance too, but in our case, it's just a model system. Right? So in this case, um, this particular microorganism called Bacillus um secretes amylase to the environment. And you can see that by looking at this halo, uh, which um, is a, a starch-free zone around a colony, right? Because, uh, because the amylase is um, secreted and diffuses away from the growing colony. And what we can do is we can uh, capture the, the amylases that are being secreted by the bacteria and then add them to uh, little test tubes that contain starts and then track the amount of starts that's being the greatest function of time. And then we can measure the, the function, the amylolytic function, by looking at the amount of starts, the greatest function of time. And that gives us the kinetics. And then we can uh, extract information about that particular function uh, of this bacterium, right? So this is a bacterium that does have this function of it on its own, right? Um, and yet, so when we measure its function, we see that indeed it has, uh, you know, a, a, a fairly decent um, amylolytic um, ability, which is what we plot here on the, on the y-axis. But then what we find, right, is that when we place these microorganisms, we, we add this microorganism in, the, in different community contexts, right? We, we co culture it with different sets of other uh, also starts degrading bacteria. Uh, the effect that that has on the net um, amylolytic rate of the entire community is often negative, right? Uh, sometimes it's positive, but it's very variable, right? And uh, 
what perhaps the, the, the main thing that is interesting is that the net contribution of these microorganisms, the total uh, community level um, amyloidic activity uh, is strongly context dependent, right? It's, it's very different in consortia that have different other different sets of other microorganisms, right? Alone, it does contribute a lot, but when you, we could culture with other microorganisms, it, it can have a negative effect, despite that all these microorganisms do secrete amylases, sometimes it has positive, but you can see there is a lot of variation. And, and so why is this? Why does the contribution of a species to a community function um, gets so different depending on which other microorganisms are present too, right? And the reason is primarily because microorganisms interact with one another, right? Um, basically, our null model could be that if we have, say, a consortium just with two bacteria and, and they did not interact in any way, and both of them were secreting uh, a particular number of amyloidic enzymes to the environment, then if there's no interactions of any kind, right, then we would be able to predict fairly easily what would be the contribution of, say, these species uh, uh, or the one, each of the two species to the function of the consortium, right, because it would be just the sum of both, right? But um, there's many, many types of interactions that can alter this. For instance, it is possible that if we co-culture together two different types of bacteria, even if they do not interact with one another in any way whatsoever, um, their enzymes they secrete, which are, are the function that we're interested in, might interact with one another. For instance, they could aggregate with each other and, and, and clump, and that would um, you know, inhibit them or, or limit their activity. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, there could also be positive interactions between the molecules that are released, right, that uh, facilitate each other's action. This is not so much the case for amylases, but for cellulases, endo and exocellulases can have synergistic uh, interactions between them, right, in the absence of any bacteria or other organisms that secrete them, simply because one is creating a substrate for the other. Yeah. So on top of these type of abiotic or biochemical interactions, microorganisms can also have ecological interactions with one another, right? Like one species might uh, have facilitated or, uh, in, or inhibitory effects in the growth of another, right? So if one of the species uh, facilitates the growth of the other, since there is more cells, and if everything else being equal, every cell produces the same number of enzymes, uh, the pair is going to have, um, uh, in inco culture, more amyloidic activity than you might expect simply by adding the contributions of each species in one culture. But even if there were no biochemical interactions and no ecological effects on population size, right? If the, if the species just grew the same in co-cultures they do in isolation, um, there are still potential uh, interactions that have to do with the level of gene expression. For instance, one of the two species might be uh, promoting uh, or inhibited uh, the production of amylase per cell in the other, right? Through, you know, quantum sensing molecules or signaling molecules, or through the, sometimes even simply the, amyloidic um, activity of these enzymes might actually produce by products that uh, in the other cell, um, in the other type of microorganism would um, reduce or sometimes even enhance uh, the amount of amylase produced per cell, right? So all of these are potential forms of interactions between uh, cells and between populations that of, of different species that can affect uh, the, uh, and create an ecological context in which the contribution of say this, this one um, species to the community function uh, to differ in different ecological contexts, depending on which interactions it has with the particular members of those communities, which are not the same. Okay? So um, in sum, up to this point, what I wanted to emphasize is that the functional contribution of a species or a strain of, of a microorganism uh, will in general be different uh, when we place it in different ecological contexts and when it co cohabits with different partners, right? And, and that is because of the interactions that that species will have with its partners, which will be different depending on which partners uh, it finds. So given these complications, right, um, uh, what can we do about it? Right? How do we go ahead and build predictive models of community function that incorporate maybe uh, uh, the, the many types of interactions that could be present at the same time? So, um, if we try to do, go down the mechanistic route and build a, a microscopic model that would incorporate all of these interactions, um, it would have to be a multi-scale model uh, that would be very complex, right? So perhaps there's other ways. And uh, one of the things that uh, I have been thinking for a long time is that perhaps we could um, borrow a page from the book uh, that is being used in, uh, in quantitative genetics. Right? So 
My argument is that geneticists um, have been uh, facing a problem that maps very well to the one that I was just describing. Uh, geneticists are often interested in being able to predict the quantitative fitness effect of a mutation, right, um, in different genetic backgrounds. And sometimes what they're interested in predicting is uh, the, how different mutations uh, will affect the, the fitness of the organism, but sometimes they're interested in, in phenotypes, right? How a particular mutation would affect the traits of that um, of the organism in which they take place. And very similar to what I was just describing before, the, um, the fitness effect of a mutation or the phenotypic effect of a mutation is affected by interactions between that mutation or the loci. Right, in, the, in the genome of the host species. So when you introduce a mutation in a particular loci, that mutation can have uh, not only an additive component uh, of, of, of fitness or phenotypic effect, but also be modulated by epistemic interactions with other loci in the genome. And when one does uh, something like what I was just describing with species, you place the same species in different community contexts. If you do something like that and you place the same mutation in different genetic contexts, you will also see that generally the fitness effect of that mutation, or again, or the phenotypic effect of that mutation, uh, will be different in different genetic contexts. And that is because of uh, it has different epistatic interactions with different uh, genetic content uh, of, its, uh, of, its, of its background. So um, that, I hope that convinces you that the, these, these folks, the evolutionary geneticists, are facing a problem that resembles a lot the one I was describing before. But one of the things that we, we, we noticed they have discovered recently, uh, which is, uh, is very interesting in fact, is that often the fitness effect of a mutation, which I plot here on the y-axis, um, can be described as a function of the fitness of the genetic background. Right? If you plot, if you put the same uh, mutation in different genetic backgrounds and, and plot the fitness effect of the mutation against the fitness of the background, uh, one often sees in empirical data that the two are correlated with one another. Right? And that you can therefore build a simple linear regression model that relates how the fitness effect of a mutation uh, changes as we place it in, in backgrounds of higher and higher fitness. Right? Um, these models um, are a representation of a phenomenon known as global epistasis, right? which is a, a, a concept that you will be hearing a lot in this talk. So um, what's very useful about this right, is that um, in this case, what you can see right, is that the fitness effect, this is the same mutation placed. Uh, this is for uh, drug resistance in, um, in some, a mutation that involves um, drug resistance in, the, um, uh, in a, a particular pathogen. and um, and what you can see is that the, the, the same mutation can have smaller and smaller effects when it's placed in genetic backgrounds of higher and higher fitness, right? This pattern is known as diminishing returns epistasis because the, again, the fitness effect become, declines uh, and, and becomes smaller when the background where the mutation is placed becomes more fit. Uh, but there is, the nice thing about this is this, this regression model is predictive of the fitness effect. And the only thing you need to be able to, to, uh, to estimate what's going to be it is going to be the fitness of background in which the mutation is inserted. So our, um, our argument uh, in, in this project was to ask, well, uh, are there parallel patterns to global epistasis that could also help us uh, describe um, how adding a species to a new species to a community um, will affect function, right? Are there analogs to global epistasis um, in ecology? So, um, so we asked this question, and then we went back to this experiment I was telling you before, right? Uh, the very first thing we did is uh, reanalyze that data. Um, and again, this experiment consisted of, we formed uh, most of the, um, of all possible combinations, uh, all, all possible co-cultures between uh, six different strains of the final bacillus, right? Bisanalis, Epidemicillus polymixa, Bacillus thuringiensis, Mohavensis, Cereus, Megaterium. What we did is that we um, made every possible, in, that, in this original paper, we made every possible, um, every possible monoculture, as well as every pair, every trio, most four members, five members, and say all uh, the one six-member consortia, right? So we basically we made the vast majority of, of every possible consortia and determined um, the amyloidic function of each of these, right? And again, the function is the, the, the rate at which each of these consortia degrades start. Uh, sorry, second Alvaro, we have a question from the chat. Um, yes. About the 
methodology maybe why every relation has to be to be reduced to linear model when we know uh, the relation is actually complex um yes um that doesn't have to be reduced right <laughs> but, but 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 perhaps um i mean the, you can do it or not do it if you don't like it right uh i i hope i can convince you today that it's actually useful to do it that way and that that can that those linear relationships can be related to the um the interactions between the species but i don't want to get too ahead of myself okay yeah thank you okay all right so so what, what we can do is this right uh we can set up um a uh various consortia with different composition yes and um and then um measure the function of the background community right the amyloidic rate for each of these different consortia which we can plot here on the on the x-axis yes and now we can we can then um, look at the same consortia that also includes um, bacillus megatheria, right? And then uh, on the y-axis, we're going to plot uh, the effect of including um, bacillus megatheria in the consortia, which is just basically, uh, for instance, it would be the amyloidic rate of the cons of this consortia, including the megatherium, minus the amyloidic rate of this consortia, right? So this will be the background. This will be the augmented consortia. And the difference is what we're plotting here on the x-axis, and the, and the function of this consortia is plotted here on the x-axis, right? Again, function of the background, and we will call the functional effect by analogy to the, to the fitness effect on the y-axis. And when we do that, what we find is that there is a clear uh, relationship between both, right? And we can build a very simple linear model uh, that describes the relationship between both, and which has a very fairly decent predictive power, yes? And when we do the same thing for every other species, right? If we make, uh, if we compare the, the the functional effect of each species against the function of the background community, right? And we plot one against the other, we find that that um, a very simple linear model does a fairly decent job at estimating what's going to be the effect of each of these additions. And what's more interesting is that we find that the the particular patterns that we observe for each species are different, right? For instance, um, take B series, which is the microorganism that we were describing before, right? Um, we find that um, the bacillus series on its own has a positive effect. It has it secretes amylase, right? So if we add it to the to the null consortium, which has zero um, um, zero function, right? Because there's nothing there. It's just basically M M9 media. Uh, it has a positive effect. Yet when we add it to most of the other consortia, it has a negative effect. Yes. Um, and uh, but still, what we find is that the the negative effect of these areas becomes larger and larger the higher uh, the the function of the consortia you added to. Right? It's this is a pattern that's known in genetics as uh, increasing cost of epistasis. There's other um, other bacteria like Bacillus, which has a um, a negative slope again, uh, but it tends to be always positive and has a pattern that in genetics is known as uh, diminishing returns. Uh, the others um, have an effect on function that is context dependent, right? Uh, everyone, uh, Mohamensis to intention and Megatherium, have a positive effect when we incorporate them to low performing consortia, but they have a negative effect uh, when we add them uh, to, uh, um, or the effect can become negative when we add them to consortia of higher function, right? So this again exemplifies that yes, um, the, the effect uh, of each of these species on community level functions can be context dependent, right? Uh, and different in different contexts, but at least part of the variation that exists can be simply explained by the function of the background community and right? through, again, very, very simple models. So we wanted to uh, determine whether this observation would extend uh, beyond the one experiment we did, right? So we, we, the next thing that we did is that we examined um, published data of combinatorially assembled uh, communities, uh, which included both plant communities that were grown in greenhouses, as well as phytoplankton or, or, um, or other bacterial communities that have been published in the literature uh, beforehand. And the function that we were looking at, and, and, and the example I gave you before was the amount of starts, uh, the rating enzymes that were being uh, secreted, but uh, the functions that we examined that have been published uh, range from biomass production to the production of other metabolites, uh, the oxidation rate of of certain sugars and, and so on. So that we're looking at, at very different communities from types of organisms as different as bacteria, 
phytoplankton or plants, and functions that are also very different ranging from biomass production to the production of particular metabolites or enzymes. So uh, here's uh, our analysis of the data that we could lay our hands on, right? Um, so this is an ex experiment, the plant experiment, where the authors assembled every possible uh, community with four different plants, and they did twice. So this is one community of four, this is another community of four, and then we repeated the same process, right? Here we're plotting the, the functional effect of each of the plants uh, when added to um, communities, uh, every community that contains all others, right? And again, we find that uh, not only the, the, um, there's these patterns that are arise that are very clear, uh, and uh, but also that the um, they were different for different plants, right? That some plants have um, um, you know different slopes and and, um, and and different regression models than than other other plants. Um, this is um, our analysis of the phytoplankton biomass data, where we show that again same thing. You know, linear models do a fairly decent job. Um, at, at predicting the, how, how adding each species to the function of the community would affect um, the total amount of biomass. And um, we find that some of the species have uh, diminished, uh, uh, increasing costs at the stasis, while others have diminishing returns. And again, um, this is just to emphasize that the patterns are different for every plant. These patterns are, uh, don't appear to be trivial then. This is a data set that where the authors looked at uh, silos of oxidation and bacteria, where again, we see the same thing, um, you know, linear models do a fairly good job. Um, in one, some cases, we find, in fact, that, they're, that actually the, the, the functional effect of a species is pretty flat, right? Um, it seems to have, uh, you know, it oscillates and fluctuates from, from consortia to consortia, but it doesn't have a particular slope, or if it is, it's zero, right? So it's, it seems to be, uh, have a negative effect on average that it seems to be fairly independent on the community function, while others, have very clear uh, patterns, right? And so that's also important. I will be uh, talking about that in a minute. This is from more data. This is from Ophelia Venturelli's lab uh, from a few years ago, uh, where they examined um, the, the functional effects of butyrate producing bacterial consortia um, from this are bacteria from, the, I think these are from the human gut microbiome. Um, and uh, and they, were, they were cultured in, um, in the lab um, under laboratory conditions. But again, same thing, the DNA models still do a fairly good job in general. Um, uh, and the particular, um, the particular equations are, um, or models are different. In some cases, actually, we see that, they're, that they might even be, have a positive slope, or the negative slopes um, tend to be still dominant. And in a few cases, we see that they're, they're more flat. All right. So um, what I was um, telling you before is that what we would like to be able to do is to have a solution for this coach's dilemma, right? Is to have a way to predict how um, including every potential species we could think of in, in of our list, right, in a um, in a bioreactor would affect the um, the function of that bioreactor, and therefore that that could help us choose which of the candidate species we have should be the ones that we are in in fact um, including. So what I hope I have convinced you so far is that linear models, um, simple linear models could be said that in fact, actually they're a very good job at, um, at predicting the effect of uh, various species on the functions of these, um, these simple microbial ecosystems, right? Now, the, the question is really why, right? Why do they work so well? So I'm going to try to give you an explanation that um, is, um, um, goes back to genetics, yes. So, um, so imagine that now, um, again, diving back to genetics, because I mean, the phenomenon is the same, and I think it's easier to think through with, with, with this. So imagine that we have um, a, um, you know, a combination of five different uh, mutations going from I, J, K, G, H. And um, um, we're going to um, um, assume that our focal mutation is I, right? So um, here on the x-axis, I'm going to plot the fitness of the genetic background uh, in, under the assumption that these mutations are completely additive, right? So if we assume there's no interaction of any kind, meaning that the fitness effect of every mutation will be the same in every, in every genetic context you put it in, right? Um, and we're going to plot here on the y-axis the fitness effect of mutation I, and here on the x-axis the fitness of the genetic background, right? So we could uh, place 
the various um, backgrounds in which the focal mutation I could insert that say, for instance, I think background that contains mutation H, but that's just mutation H, or H and K, or you know, G and K, and so on, right? And just so that you are aware, I'm going to split uh, here on, on, on the left, I'm going to put uh, those that contain mutation J as well. Now, um, by assumption, we're going to be assuming that all mutations are beneficial. This is for convenience. It doesn't matter, right? We could, I could, the argument I'm about to make could be made with any other uh, assumptions I could think of, but this is makes things easier to understand from a conceptual standpoint, right? So again, I'm going to be assuming that all of these mutations are additive and they're all beneficial, right? For the, the fitness of our organism. All right, so under this context, when we add mutation I to each of this, um, each of these backgrounds, we're going to have we're going to find the same uh, fitness effect in every background, right? Precisely because they're additive, right? And and it's uh, the fitness effect is positive because we're assuming that I is beneficial, just the same as every other mutation. Now, okay, so far this should be very trivial, right? So far, does that all I'm saying is that if everything is is additive, then the fitness effect condition will be the same in every background where you could put it in. Now imagine that there was just one single epistatic interaction in this five mutation in the slot skin, right? This will occur between mutation I and mutation J. And, and this epistatic uh, term is gonna be epsilon IJ, yes? Now, for those uh, backgrounds that contain mutation J, which are, are those three here, right? And there's more than this, right? I'm just depicting this fix for, for clarity. Um, we would find that in those, in those backgrounds where mutation J is present, the fitness effect of mutation I is going to be equal to the additive components will be the same as we found for those backgrounds that do not contain mutation J, plus the, the epsilon IJ which describes the interaction between mutation I and J. Now, this term will not be present in these backgrounds because they don't, J is not there, right? It will only be present in those backgrounds where J is present too. So now this creates a vertical displacement uh, in the fitness effect of mutation I when J is present relative to when J is not. Now, um, because J is by assumption beneficial also, then we would expect that on average, those backgrounds that contain J are going to have a higher fitness background, a higher fitness than those genetic backgrounds that do not contain J, right? That will create a horizontal displacement to the right. So now the combination of a vertical displacement caused by interactions between I and J and of a horizontal displacement in the background caused by the fitness effect of J, which is positive, will create a positive slope between, uh, in, if, we, if we were to do a regression, and the slope is going to be proportional to um, the, the vertical displacement, epsilon IJ, uh, over the horizontal um, displacement, delta FJ, right? That's so basically the tangent of that, uh, of that line. Now, um, it is possible um, in, in genetics, and people like you know, Andobeli and Desai already derived a, a version of this equation before us, um, it is possible to actually um, take um, this, um, this very simple logic and extend it to uh, more complex situations where instead of um, every mutation being additive, uh, you have mutations that interact with each other and uh, in, in epistatic ways. And when we do that, what we find is that, um, that the slope of their, of their still uh, predicted to be a, a the regression slope uh, between uh, the, the fitness effect and the fitness of the background. Uh, and that, that slope can be written as a sum over every mutation of the, of the, same, um, the same slope that we have here, basically um, this over this. Uh, um, but it's the, instead of just, because now we're including um, multiple different backgrounds and more complexity, instead of having just one interaction, uh, it would be the, uh, the average pairwise and the average epistatic interaction between mutation I and J average over every background divided over the average fitness effect of mutation J divided over uh, or average over every background. And we can put it uh, multiplied by some weighing uh, factor that for, for the moment, uh, for today's purposes, it doesn't really matter, right? So my point here is that it is possible to calculate how exactly the, the slope, the regression slope between fitness effect and the fitness of the background should uh, uh, emerges right from every possible pairwise interaction and the fitness effect of every uh, mutation that we can have, right? 
Um, this is just to show you that that this equation actually does a very good job at, uh, at describing what the, it's, it's, it's still approxima approx an approximation, right? Because we are neglecting um, uh, higher than third order interactions, uh, although they are implicitly assume, uh, kind of considered in the, in, the, in the equation as well. But here we're looking at data from a genetic fitness landscape uh, by Khan et al., which was published uh, about 10 years ago. So five different mutations. It's a, a, a complete landscape of uh, every possible um, every possible combination of five different beneficial mutations in, in E. coli. And what you can see is that um, this is the fitness effect, the fitness of the background, that there are these patterns of global epistasis we were described before, but also that the, the predicted fit, which is shown here in, in, in TAN, right, uh, matches fairly well the, the actually observed regression slope um, that we see if we do just the best fit uh, linear regression model. Why is this interesting? Right? This is actually, I, I believe, very profound because it tells you that there, the, these global epistasis patterns emerge from many potential um, pairways and higher order epistatic interactions. And without having to know all of these interactions, you can still do a fairly good job at predicting um, what the fitness effect of the condition is going to be because all of these pairwise and higher order interactions end up being funneled uh, into this one parameter, um, which is the slope of the regression, and uh, which you, you only need a few. And because of the, the rather good fits we get, um, you can you only need a few data points to estimate what that slope will be, right? So it might not be necessary to estimate every possible interaction pairwise and higher order than that we could have in a genetic system to do a fairly good job at, at being able to predict what's going to be the fitness effect of a mutation um, in this context. So what we wanted to do then is to ask whether this kind of um, this, this uh, theory that was developed for in the context of genetics could be also used to predict the patterns of global epistasis that we see in our uh, community function landscapes. So we went back to the data that I was just presenting before um, and, and, and I just want to walk you through a few examples, right? Um, this is from the starts degrading communities that I showed before. You might remember that too, we had six bacteria, but previously I had only shown you uh, five different um, species. The sixth is this one, is uh, Penemacillus polymixa. It does not have diminishing returns. In fact, it has uh, increasing returns of epistasis. And um, here on um, the, uh, the we, we again, we plot the, 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 the functional effect of adding people in mix up to different uh, community backgrounds. And on the x-axis, we're plotting the function of the various backgrounds in which we add it. And um, this, uh, this line here is the, um, the um, predicted slope using the same equation that was developed for, um, for genetics, where we are uh, here we're plotting simply the average pairwise interaction between um, people in mix and every other species across all backgrounds. And here we're plotting the, the average uh, functional effect of every other species uh, across all backgrounds. And we see that we have a positive slope, right? That in this case, the, the slope is positive. And we can actually show why this is, right? The reason why this slope is positive, right, is because it is being, um, is being made so by all pairwise interactions between people in mixa and every other species, which on average, every, pos every one of these uh, pairwise interactions is uh, positive, right? So if you pile up synergistic functional interactions, you end up with a slope that is positive. Uh, I was telling you before that for some species in some of the communities we analyzed, uh, the slope was zero, right? Uh, and, uh, and interestingly enough, this does not mean that there's no global epistasis, but it, the, what this is reflecting is that um, pairwise uh, interactions, a result of every background, are as likely to be positive as negative, right? So there, there are positive interactions uh, with some community members, but there's also some negative interactions. The two balance out, and we end up with um, a net contribution of a slope that is zero, right? Which is exactly what we see here. Um, and again, we're plotting on, on, on solid line that is the predicted slope, and on dashed line, that's the, the actual regression that we get calculated from the data. And this is again, this is for the plants, right? Where we saw that um, all um, global epistasis um, trends we were seeing are negative. And in this case, when you actually examine the, the, the for a particular, for a particular uh, individual species, uh, we examine uh, the pairwise interactions it has with every other community member and by uh, averaging over every other background, 
found that they're, they're all negative, right? They're competitive. So aggregating com competitive interactions leads to uh, negative slopes, right? So in other words, what I, I think is very useful is because uh, we can rationalize the shape of these regression lines on the basis of the uh, of the um, microscopic interactions between species, right? When those interactions are primarily positive, we end up seeing positive slopes. When they're primarily negative, we see negative slopes. And when negative and positive epistasis are occurring at the same time, we end up seeing this, um, these flat slopes, uh, which can, in, can be in this case negative, but sometimes they could also be positive, yes? So, um, and the nice thing is that all of this can be um, can be explained uh, through through mathematically, right? And we have um, the, an, an, an equ equations that describe this uh, approximately, but you can increase more and more terms if you need them. So far, even even staying up to second order here um, does a very good job at at, uh, at predicting uh, the functions that we observe. So, um, I just wanted to also uh, comment on something that I think is very nice, which is that. Um, it is, it is possible to keep digging and in some cases um, help us rationalize the mechanistic uh, processes that give rise to these interactions, right? Uh, for instance, um, I, was, I was telling you before that people in Ixe has a, has a positive slope, that when you examine the interactions at the population level, uh, then you see that they tend to be positive, but then that still doesn't tell you why they're positive, right? So in previous work, we had determined that in fact, uh, Penelocilus polymixa is a biotin oxytrope, which means that under the conditions of our experiment, it grows very poorly on its own. And um, um, this bacterium, in fact, although it grows very poorly in isolation, it grows very well when in co-culture with every other community member, right? And the reason why that is, is because every other community member is capable of cross-feeding it with biotin, which is uh, the, an essential vitamin that polymixa cannot synthesize on its own. So, I mean, in this case, we happen to know what the mechanism is, but in a case where we wouldn't know, right, simply looking for these patterns would hint that there are a lot of positive interactions and that can help us identify what, uh, a phenomenon that we could then examine at the molecular level and tell us and, and start digging and, and understanding right, why um, those positive interactions are taking place and what is the, what is the mechanism for that, right? Uh, so the, in, in addition to being help us predict uh, the function, uh, the functional effect of, of community members, the global epistasis patterns can help us identify the existence of mechanistic interactions between species that can be relevant from a functional perspective. Okay, so now so far I've been only telling you about predicting the effect of adding one species to a community, right? But ideally, we would, what we want to be able to do is to predictively and quantitatively link community composition and function, right? This is, if, if I had the, um, the functional effects mapped out for three different species, could we use that to predict what would be the function of a consortium that included all of those three species and the same, in the same environment where these um, functional effects equations have been determined? So, um, um, our idea was that, yes, it should be possible, right? And uh, the idea would be very simple. It's if, say that we have the functional effects of these equations for these three species, uh, it should be possible to calculate uh, what would be the function of the trio simply by concatenating them, the application of, this, of these equations. For instance, um, if we added um, this bacterium alone in monoculture to the no community, which has nothing in it, right? And the function of the, of the null would be zero, right? And using this equation, you could predict what should be the effect of adding this species uh, to a community of zero function. Now, that's now your, your background community, which would have a function here, right? And using this equation, you could predict what would be the effect of adding this green species to the to a monoculture of blue, right? So it would give, put us here. And now that brings us to some other point in there that becomes the new background. And then we can use the same, this equation for the red species to calculate what would be the effect of adding this, the red species to it, right? So by concatenating these, um, these linear equations, that should give you a, um, a metric for um, a, a prediction for what would be the, um, the, functional, uh, the function of the tree, right? So um, to test this idea, what uh, we went and, and did some, because all the experiments I told you before were done before by us, as well as by other authors, but we wanted to do this experiment properly. So uh, Juan Diaz-Colunga, who's a really talented postdoc in my lab, 
he uh, went ahead and assembled, I think it was 160 different uh, communities out of uh, the 256 potential consortia you could assemble with eight different species. And um, for those communities that he assembled, this is just a, a, a subset of all the ones that he could have, uh, he measured the functional effect equations for the um, for eight those eight different communities, eight different uh, species. In this case, the function was the total amount of pyoverdin that was being secreted um, by the community, right? And here on the on the y-axis, I am plotting um, how adding each of these eight species to um, a number of different background consortia would affect the total amount of pyoverdin produced by each of these consortia. Again, we see that the function effect equations are different for different species. And because we did this thing in replicate, we have error bars and so on. So now we have a, a bit, have, can be very confident in, in, our, in our models. Um, and, and now with those models, what we can do is uh, apply this concatenation idea that I told you before, right? So we can simply um, take for any consortium uh, that we have not already formed, that is not part of our, uh, of our actual experiment, we could predict what should be the function of those consortia, right? By, by taking um, these data and, and concatenating the functional effect equations to make those predictions. So uh, Juan actually went ahead then, right? And assembled those consortia that he had not assembled before. And just to be clear, this experiment was not that we have, we assembled everything and then we split uh, some as a testing, uh, as, a, as, a, as a training set and some as a, as a test set. It's, it's, a, it's a true, let's take some chunk, measure, you know, do the experiment, and then next we go back to the lab and assemble the ones that we didn't assemble before and see if we can predict them and how, how good the predictions are, right? So if, um, if, the, if the idea worked, what we would expect to see is if we plot here the predicted function, here the observed function for this new set of consortia, they should be uh, around this, this, this identity line, right? The predicted and observed should be the same. And, and this is the data that Juan collected by going back to the lab and assembling those consortia and measuring the function. I would say it's very good, right? And these are, these are a biological, new set of biological experiments. Now, if we go back to the data that we had previously analyzed, and now, because of course, this is already published data, we cannot you know, redo every experiment, but we could do what I was describing before and simply split the data into a, a subset that is a training set and a subset that is uh, the test set. And by doing so, we can repeat the same analysis. Um, and, and this is for the bacterial cell association data, they observed the predicted function of the communities. Um, this is for the, our the starch hydrolysis data, uh, the butyrate secretion, uh, above ground plant biomass, uh, phytoplankton biomass. And, uh, and in all cases, we find that uh, this very, very simple idea can do a fairly good job at predicting what's going to be the function of the, um, of the mercury consortia um, in an in, in out of sample fashion, right? This is, in, in all these cases, this is out of sample prediction. So um, um, I'm reaching to the end of the talk. Um, I, I was telling you at the beginning that our objective was to um, develop methodologies that could help us resolve this ecological coaches dilemma. And, um, and one of the things that I, I, I enjoy telling people because I think it's kind of fun is that in fact, uh, the same approach can be helpful to resolve the actual coaches dilemma, right? So we, uh, what Juan and Georgia, who are um, uh, basketball fans did is that they grabbed data from the NBA, I think it was a 2015, 2016 season. And, um, and uh, here uh, they took the data for a bunch of players because these statistics are, are online if, if you care enough to find them. And here on the x-axis, what they're plotting is um, the, um, in the y-axis they're plotting uh, what is the effect of, um, of playing, putting each of these players on the, on the ground. Uh, on the pits and um, on the x on the y axis, they're putting the effect on the difference between points score and, uh, and, and points against, right? Uh, the, let's call them plus minus statistic um, per minute, right? While this player was there, and here on the x axis, they're putting that on average, uh, what's what's the plus minus statistic uh, of the uh, quartet uh, of other players that um, were uh, that are accompanying the, the focal player, right? And very similar to what we found for, for microbial um, organisms, there's some players that are um, pre, you know, uh, context independent. They have the same uh, positive effect no matter who else is on the team. Some players have, in fact, a bit of a positive slope, right? Where 
Um, the, the, the cleanest interpretation for this is that they make their teammates better. And some of the players have, in fact, a, a negative uh, patterns uh, indicating that, you know, they do very well on when the, the quartet is, is not doing well or it's um, uh, is losing, but they have diminishing returns and their effect becomes smaller and smaller when the quartet of teammates becomes better, right? Um, so uh, perhaps uh, this, is, this tells us something that could be useful in other contexts. And uh, you know that the mathematics of the of fitness landscape tells us that it, that the the emergence of global epistasy should be a very widespread phenomenon that uh, really extends beyond uh, genetics into any kind of landscape of any kind. Right? And whenever you can uh, have a quantitative map between composition and function, these patterns should be observed. Um, these are the, the the wonderful people from my new lab in Madrid. Juan who did a lot of the work on on this front, and Magda and Andrea, a postdoc and a technician who are um, also uh, doing all kinds of new, exciting work that I didn't have time to tell you today. Um, that really is all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you all for your attention. So thank you a lot, Alvaro. Very nice talk. Uh, so we have a few minutes for uh, questions. So please, if someone has a question, just open the microphone or raise hands and So I see a lot of clap claps and some questions there from Clement, please. Yeah, uh, this is not Clement, but somebody in the room with him. Okay. Uh, when you perform the com uh, the complement pack, you put three of them together. That operation is not commutative. So which of the order would you choose to in in the prediction that would change what you are predicting, right? It is. It is. Uh, so it's not. You're you're right. It's not commutative. Um, it, it it gets technical to describe uh, how we did it. It's in the it's in the print. We describe it there. Um, we basically used a very simple statistical techniques to infer the residuals. So if the so it's not commutative if we only have the the um, the, the global epistasis terms, but if you actually included the, the, the residuals, right, the part of the of um, of the function is deviates from the, from the global epistasis, if you include that, then it is committed. In fact, it has to be, right, because the function of a community depends on 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 the on the composition in a one to one manner, right. Uh, it's so it is possible to do it when you take into account as well the um, the residuals. And the residuals can be estimated, um, and we we show it in the preprint how we do it. And maybe it gets kind of technical for to describe um, in, with the time we have, but I invite you to check it out. Right, it's on by archive, and um, and again, and if if of course if you haven't have any questions or, or comments about how we did it, I'm more than happy to to chat about it afterwards or whenever you think it would be a good time for you. Okay, thank you. So before going on with the question, I maybe read the one that is in the chat already. And uh, actually we are asking, uh, are environment, environmental factors considered in the model? Um, that's a, a, a great question. Um, so far, no, we are assuming that in the data I've described, uh, the environment is fixed. But the project that Andrea and Magda are doing at the moment is precisely that, right? They are, they are extending the same idea to combinations of environmental factors as well as communities of species, right? And uh, the results are, are really, really cool. It, it, it can be, in fact, uh, treated all under the same formalism. And, uh, and so environmental factors can be treated as de facto other species in the system uh, for intents and purposes. Thank you. Uh, please, Haris. Uh, hi, can you hear me? I can, yes. Hi, thank you very much for the for the talk. Amazing, amazing work. So I have like two questions. One uh, is uh, so I was wondering why 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 do you think we have so many corvairs? <laughs> I mean, you had you saw so many negative uh, uh, <laughs> uh, negative cases, and uh, I I want I, I'm wondering if there's any reason for that. And my second question. Uh, is uh, about the the last experiments that you showed uh, with the one hundred and sixty cases, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, I was I was wondering if you tried to go uh, the other way around. So once you added uh, a species, 
and uh, you measured if then you removed that and you saw that the community's behavior was the initial one so that that's it thank you okay uh with so with respect to the first question um the the, I uh, so I, I I'm not 100% sure why that is right but you're right right um, negative negative um, uh, negative slopes are far more common. This is true in genetics also right so most of the global epistasis patterns that have been reported are diminishing returns epistasis and um, and it still remains rare the, to find um, increasing uh, um, fitness effects right positive slopes. The, there is a one potential reason, and I, again, this is one of the things I, I still want to make sure I nail down, but um, we have found that it, that if um, regression to the mean alone would tend to create negative negative slopes, right? So if you had a completely random landscape, uh, that random landscape would be characterized by negative slopes. So I think it's very possible that that, that very fact is, is weighs down uh, in favor of, uh, of negative slopes. As for the first, uh, second question, I, I, uh, these communities are a single batch, right? So um, it's, um, it's completely reversible to add or remove them, right? Because what we're doing is we assemble the community and we just grow for, um, in this case, it was 48 hours. And after 48 hours, we measure the function, right? So they were not being passaged, right? And, and in the case, so that um, adding or removing ends up being completely symmetric from the perspective of the, of the, of the math and of the, of the experimental setup. Uh, itself. We have done experiments where communities were passaged to equilibrium and then perturbed and, um, and, um, and examined again. And in fact, if, if I'm not mistaken, that would be, this would be the data, right? Where we had uh, communities that were stable, right? And um, after passaging many, many times, and then we had a library of different, so we had a library of eight communities and eight different um, species, and each species uh, was added to the eight community backgrounds, right? And then they were stabilized again, so we can compare the stable community um, after passaging the, the, the augmented community minus um, the, the you know, parental community without it, right? Uh, patterns are seen also, uh, and, and there are those, uh, so global epistasis patterns are describing, as shown here, the, the, the functional effects of communities. Again, this is bioverdin production. Um, and, um, yeah, what we have not done in this case is to then remove it, right? Uh, this is an experiment we have not done, uh, but I would not imagine, my, my impression is that this should not be symmetric now, right? Um, and, and I am not sure, experimentally removing species tends to be harder than uh, including them, because you have to knock them in, knock them out uh, selectively, and that's often hard. Um, but, but then, yes, I mean, uh, for, for stable communities, uh, for, for serially passive communities, that is a, a question we have not addressed. For single bus communities, uh, it, it's completely symmetric, right? The two, um, the two are essentially the same. So thank you, uh, Phil Gibbs, please. Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I have a question I think is more relevant to the experiments you just discussed. Like it seems like the difference between the mutation question or the basketball question and an ecology question is the abundances of the different species can adjust on the basis of who's present and who's not. And in an extreme example, you could be excluded from the community when you add a different species. And so I'm curious to know like how this approach can, you know, account for that. Is it being integrated into the coefficient somehow or is it, yeah, or maybe you don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Um, uh, so uh, and the approach I've described uh, is completely agnostic about species abundances, right? It does not play in. So we're, we're not including them, uh, that information in the, um, at all for the for for the approach uh, in the experiment I'm showing right here, right? Um, I wish I had the <laughs> I keep asking Juan to send me that plot to put it in, and I keep forgetting to adding it. Um, uh, this is actually an interesting experiment. The the species that we are knocking in, right? Often in about half of the of the data that I'm showing here, um, it doesn't make it. So we add the species passage, and the species we added one went extinct, right? And uh, the, the patterns are still seen. I have that I really don't have a clear explanation for why that is, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't understand it. I would have expected to matter much more than we find it does. And we have repeated the experiment and it's, it's consistent, right? So uh, when, when you uh, do this even in stable, steadily propagated communities where we have no control over, or, over the abundance of the species that are present, right? And we have no control over what happens once we add it in, 
um, the, the patterns are still there, right? And regardless of what happens, what density these species, for instance, this one here reaches in the final community, right? I do not have an explanation for why this is, right? Uh, and we are now trying to figure it out, but I, I, I don't, uh, I, we don't know. Yeah. Thank you. So another question from the uh, chat. Uh, do you consider exploring the interaction using genome scale metabolic models? Um, you, you, we can, we have in the past, right? Um, uh, try that. We have found that genome scale metabolic models are very useful um, for, for, for drawing understanding and, uh, and, and to make conceptual progress about um, how micro communities function. In some cases, I know that they can be used successfully and have been used successfully. I think Will Harcom uh, definitely has, and other groups I know have been successful at using metabolic scale models to predict um, collective traits of micro communities. Uh, but it's, it tends to be very difficult and you need to calibrate for a particular community and, and calibrate the models very well, right? So those genome scale metabolic models also do not capture many phenomena that are left out. For instance, gene regulation, um, cell motility sometimes is also difficult to put in um, and, and so on, right? So th there are limits to those models as well. But in, if you calibrate them properly, uh, they can also have some predictive power, at least in some cases. The problem they have is that, that they require a lot of um, calibration and individual level tuning for a particular system in order to work um, and to, in order to reach uh, levels of prediction that are comparable to what I'm describing today. Uh, we have another question from Jacopo, please. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very inspiring. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, it's about, it's more conceptual and deals with uh, uh, what we are actually measuring because uh, for each experiment you showed, uh, authors focused on a particular uh, on a particular function, but obviously ecosystems provide uh, several functions at the same time. And uh, I would like to um, have a comment from you of how this multi uh, multi-target functioning of ecosystems, uh, what's the role of that? And uh, the second uh, is uh, if uh, one can predict similar patterns uh, for, let's say, the fitness gain and the fitness landscape by population dynamics model like the MacArthur or the Lotka Volterra, and what's the state of, uh, of that? Thank you. Um, so for the second question, um, then the, I, I think, so Ophelia has been trying to, to do this with um, load Caltera models. Um, I think at some point I, I am not sure. I mean, he, one of the things that, that we're finding is that population dynamics are, if, if this is correct, right? And so far this is what we're seeing, um, not really that necessary. Uh, for prediction uh, of community function. I think probably that is within reason and there will be some limits for these fails, right? Uh, but so far we have not needed to, um, to, to do that. Um, Sepe Kuhn, who's gonna be talking the seminar series next week or, or soon, I don't, can't remember, no exact, I don't know when yeah, exactly. Yeah, next week, yeah, it's correct. Uh, so, so Sepe has also some papers where they've been trying to build this population dynamics models for um, denitrifying communities, right? And, and I think they were largely successful with, but they were small communities too, right? My sense is that the, the more and more species you put in, the more and more parameters you need to know, and, and probably the more sensitive your model becomes to how many potential interactions parameters you have, right? For Lotka Volterra, um, if they only consider up to pairwise interactions, if there are any higher order interactions, then the number of potential interactions you have really blows up with community size, right? So I, I think it's possible to do it for particular systems if you're careful enough and willing to put the work to calibrate them um, in, in the level of detail that is required. But, uh, but it, they have the drawback that the number of parameters uh, explodes very rapidly with community size, right? Um, your first question, what was your first question? I'm sorry, I, I forgot. The first question was about uh, multifunctioning in ecosystems. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Um, uh, the, 
our you know our mindset is on on how to optimize macro communities, right? So um, if you are interested in simultaneously optimizing two, or I mean, like when, when you, if you if you want to optimize, you need to find your target, your objective function, right? Is what is it that you want to optimize, right? And if you want to optimize two things at the same time, right? Then you need to uh, find an you know uh, an objective function that is um, ultimately um, a compromise between both because of then there's trade-offs and things like that, right? So um, if you have a, say, two functions, right, that you can define a, a two-dimensional space of every possible combination of those, um, you could always pick a point that is your target and then uh, determine how far you are from it, right? Because as the, the distance between the functional community and the target, and then that becomes the, that, that, that will become your function. That's how I would approach it if if I was faced with that uh, question. But it, it is truly um, an open area of research in our lab is to try to understand what to do um, when when we have multidimensional functional data, which we are collecting at the moment um, in, uh, with uh, pseudomonas communities. Uh, but yes, I mean, I, I, this, is a, 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 this is what we see at the, at the, at the moment, right, is, is to uh, try to define a, a scalar objective function, which could be simply the distance uh, between the function of a community in that multidimensional space and the target goal we have, uh, because in that case, where you would want to be as, to be as close as possible to that to that target. Okay, thank you for the answer. Okay, yeah. thank you. And More, yeah. Maxim. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, so I, I have a, a question. Given all the the communities you explored in the end. And you see that everything, well, the change in fitness is very small, in fact. So you can clearly tell that, well, take the assumption that this is linear then. So in the end, it's very rare to find something which is going to increase above the linearity uh, community, which is already good, if I understand well. I think the linearity is not necessary, right? And we, we have in fact, cases where the, the best models are not linear, right? Uh, but, but it's not linear in, in interesting ways, right? I mean, I mean, of course you could, every linear regression you could make non-linear if you want, right? <laughs> uh, and, and then you can, yeah, I mean, you can add parameters um, and you can do regularization if you wanna keep, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it's possible to do, but there's some things that are more interesting than that, right? Um, for instance, we often see um, uh, to keep the, to keep this talk reasonable, I've been uh, looking at cases where there is uh, global epistasis, but we also find many instances of regional epistasis. But which, what, what by that we mean is that there's different regions of the landscape uh, are described by a different linear regression. Yes, um, so the instead of having a single linear model, we have a piecewise linear um, fit. Uh, um, that is not piecewise in the sense that we are have two regions on the x-axis and we try to fit it separate, although that in part is true, but rather than um, the, the presence or absence of particular species uh, puts every consortia, that, every background consortia that have those species uh, on a different level, and those consortia can be, um, they can be fitted by a different model than the ones that don't have it. But we often see that uh, it's in fact quite common. It's common in genetics as well. Um, if you go to uh, look at the, the work from Michael Desai's lab, for instance, with uh, fitness landscapes and yeasts, uh, they often see that, right? They often see that there, there is a, um, there are, the, the global patterns are made by uh, clumping together different regions of the fitness landscape, each of which has its own uh, regression slope. Sometimes those are flat even, right? Um, and other cases, they have a, a slope of their own, right? So that's, I think that's, that case is interesting um, and perhaps more so than simply adding more terms to 20 regression, which of course you can do, right? I mean, there's uh, there's no limit, right? And in, in yeah. how, many, how many terms you want to do if you want to do a polynomial regression instead. Yeah. Um, but but I think uh, that, that the thing that for us, that line, linear models in the case I've shown you today work fairly well and um, and they do so well that really um, there's no, no, no need to include uh, more complicated. Um, yeah. I mean, th this for me, this is super cool because I mean, it's super cool, but in, in, a, in another way, super sad because if linearity uh, works, it means there is no big jackpot where uh, you've got uh, an emergent properties in the community. I mean, if you can explain things, but by, by uh, 
I add this fitness to this fitness to this fitness, then there is no really uh, above linearity uh, phenotyping of the fitness effect of the community yeah. up here. And so you, there is no jackpot, which eventually this is what you are looking for, putting to get up and having a higher fitness in the end. Yeah, as I said, you know, there are many cases where there are different regions and um, and no linearities that are described that way, right? Um, it's also we have not examined yet, and we are this is in the in the in the works, and one of the things the directions we want to take is to explore how the complexity of the function might change the statistics of um, global epistasis that I have described, right? Um, all of the functions that I've shown today are um, simple enough that it can be carried out by every species in isolation, or at least most of them, right? Um, and uh, and they do not require complex interactions to be carried out. I think it's um, relatively straightforward to imagine situations where you would need uh, specific combinations of species to execute the function, right? Not just uh, to improve it, but to simply even have it, right? Um, and where that is could be there. Um, some of the experiments I was describing before we're doing at the moment are directed to exploring that that particular question. If we if we can manipulate the complexity of the function, which we're trying at the moment, um, then we could try to ask how, as we increase that complexity or that sparsity, both of them uh, can are slight, somewhat different and but also interesting on their own on their own right. Um, how that could impact the types of patterns that we see. And, and does this increase regionality? Does it make patterns more ragged? Or the, what, 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 what do we get um, if, if we do that, right? So we are trying to explore that at the moment. Um, so you, you're right, right? That if everything was linear, then everything would be very smooth, right? And, and, and I'll ask that with complete reality, it would be super smooth uh, and very boring, but, but at the same time, very great for optimizing purposes, right? Because if, if, uh, if you want to make the best community, then you know exactly what to do. Um, I think that the particular patterns you see are going to depend on how how complex the function you are trying to build is, and also how um, how widespread among the list of bacteria uh, it is also, right? So both of those are going to be important. Thanks for all your thoughts. Okay, thank you. Actually, we are running out of time, and if there is no other really pertinent question at the moment, maybe there is one in the chat, I will read it very quickly. Uh, someone would like to know whether there is any relation um, to topology, basically to study in a more topological way the system, if you have a very quick answer. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I quite understand. <laughs> uh, here it says, uh, okay, uh, I have a question related to the current discussion, basically the question of uh, Maxim. Uh, I would like to know whether there is a way to find the relation in more topological way. My thoughts are just to see beyond the linear relation. So that's what is written. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe I could have a more engaged discussion with this person because I'm not quite sure I could yeah. truly understand what they mean. But, but, but yeah, I mean, what I was telling uh, Andre before was uh, that that if if the if the landscape might, is more rugged, um, then I believe that the patterns we see could change. Right? In, if the landscape was, um, I don't know. Again, this might not be answering the question. But if the landscape was, um, if you randomize an actual landscape, right? If if, if the landscape was literally random, <laughs> um, so in that case, what you see is uh, every species would have the exact same global epistasis pattern. Uh, they would all have a negative slope. They would all cut the x-axis the, around the same point. Uh, they would all have a negative slope of minus one and an R squared of 0.5. Um, so th there is a, a clear relationship in the sense that when landscapes are random, then the patterns of wild epistasis are there, uh, but they're boring and every species has the same. If the landscape is completely smooth, then everything is flat and there's no <laughs> uh, this additive, right? Uh, in between, you could have all kinds of different things, right? But, but how, how, do you, um, how exactly the, the landscape topography uh, translates to the, the patterns one sees is a question that I think is to be explored. And I, I don't think it has been adequately explored, even in the context of genetic fitness landscapes, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thank you. I think it's time to uh, end the meeting. And I would like to thank again uh, Alvaro for the nice presentation and being here, the audience for participating. I also 